In this session, we are going to describe the anatomy of the last four cranial nerves as they share their uh, relations after they leave the cranial cavity and also share many of their functions as cranial nerves. We'll group them first and then describe each one alone. So the last four cranial nerves are the 9s, the 10s, 11s, and the 12s. So here is the common relations of the last cranial nerves as they leave the cranial cavity. The 9s, the 10s, the 11s leave the cranial cavity through the middle part of the jugular foramen. At the base of the skull, they lie between the internal carotid artery and the internal jugular vein. Deep to the salad process and the structures attached to it, which we call it them the siloid apparatus. The posterior and also deep the posterior of the gastric. So the three of them will descend from the middle part of jugular foramen between the internal carotid and the internal jugular, deep to two things: the siloid apparatus and the vestibule of the gastric, while the 12th nerve will leave the skull through the hypoglossal canal, first deep to the internal jugular, and then join the group. Here we'll summarize or see all the uh, relations and the parts in that view. The glossopharyngeal, the vagus, the accessory, the hypoglossal nerve, that is the anza cervicalis, that is the posterior bill of the gastric, that is the siloid apparatus, and that is the common carotid artery, that is the internal jugular vein, and that is the internal carotid artery, and that is the external carotid artery. From this very simple diagram, we can see the relations of the last four cranial nerves as they came out from the cranial cavity. Now, there is common functions again for the uh, last four cranial nerves, as we said. The most uh, uh, two cranial nerves sharing in most of their functions are the glossopharyngeal and the vagus. These two nerves have almost the same functions but different only in one nucleus. If we start by the glossopharyngeal nerve, it has a general visceral affluent fibers from the nucleus solitarius or going to the nucleus solitarius, that is the nucleus solitarius, and special visceral afferent going also to the same nucleus. Then it has general somatic afferent going to the dorsal or spinal nucleus of the trigeminal, and it has a special visceral efferent fibers which comes from the nucleus ambiguous, and lastly, general visceral efferent, the parasympathetic, which comes from the inferior salivatory nucleus for the glossopharyngeal. When it comes to the vagus, it has the same. It has general visceral efferent from the same nucleus, special visceral efferent, same nucleus as the glossopharyngeal, General somatic afferent, the same nucleus, the dorsal, the, the uh, spinal nucleus trigeminal, and special visceral afferent from the same, the ambiguous, and the different one is the general visceral afferent, the parasympathetic, from the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus. That is the common functions almost for the vagus and the glossopharyngeal. Let's start by the glossopharyngeal nerve. The glossopharyngeal nerve, as we have seen it, have functions of four functions, general or five uh, functions, general somatic afferent, general visceral afferent, special visceral afferent, general visceral efferent, and special visceral efferent. The nuclei of origin are in the medulla oblongata, and these are spinal nucleus trigeminal, Nucleus of Telectus Solitarius, Inferior Salivatory Nucleus, 
nucleus ambiguous this is the four nuclei for the uh, glossopharyngeal as we have said before superficial origin from the side of the medulla between the olive and the inferior cerebellar peduncle and this is a common superficial origin for the nines the tens and the elevens the three of them from the same side that's where it uh, points the uh, the arrow to the uh, nerve the foramen all of them the three of them i mean the nines tens and elevens from the middle part of the jugular foramen if we come to the course relation of this nerve at the base of the skull the nerve lies will, will, will repeat the same common relation for the three of them so at the base of the skull the nerve lies between the internal jugular and the internal carotid deep to the styloid process or the steroid apparatus the posterior the gastric then the nerve pass between the internal and external carotid arteries to reach the posterior border of the hyoglossus muscle and then curves forward behind the silopharyngeus that is the nerve here and this is the silopharyngeus then pass between the superior and middle constrictors to end in breaking to its sternum branches that is the very short course of the glossopharyngeal nerve the common relation then the relation to the silopharyngeus and the hyoglossus at the posterior border of that muscle then pass between the two could extract to the superior and middle to end in the pharynx that is the nerve here it has two ganglia a superior ganglia which has no branches and they consider it a detached part of the inferior one which is more important its branches carry general sensations from that the inferior ganglia which correspond to the dorsal root ganglia in the spinal nerves any sensor nerve to go inside the central nervous system have to relay outside so this ganglia have the uh, uh, gestation from the pharynx from the soft palate from the tonsils and the test fibers from the posterior third of the tongue the branches of the glossopharyngeal are the tympanic branch which we have seen when we talk about the parotid gland this branch of the inferior ganglia reaches the tympanic cavity through the tympanic canaliculus, which is found in the middle part of the jugular foramen. Then it forms a tympanic plexus with sympathetic fibers on the medial roll of the medial ear cavity. Then, out of the plexus, the lesser petrosal nerve will arise, which will reach the cranial cavity. Then, pass out through the foramen aval to relay in the otic ganglia. The fibers carried by the auriculotemporal nerve to the parotid gland, that is the tympanic branch. The carotid branch to the carotid sinus and body, it carries stimuli about the blood pressure. The branches again are the pharyngeal branches, which is the sensor root of the pharyngeal plexus, carry general sensation from the pharynx. The muscle branches supply only one muscle, which is the silopharyngeus tonsillar branches to the palatine tonsil and the palate and lastly lingual branches which will carry taste fibers and general sensation from the posterior third of the tongue that is a summary of the branches of the glossopharyngeal nerve that is the tympanic branch which go to the tympanic plexus and that is the auditory tube in the middle ear cavity it come out at the lesser petrosal which rely in the otic ganglia carried by the auricular tumoral to the parotid gland. And this is the carotid branch to the carotid sinus. That is the only muscle supplied by the uh, nerve, the silopharyngeus. That is the tonsillar branch to the platan tonsil and the pharyngeal branches on the surface of the middle constrictor. And lastly, the lingual branches to the tongue carrying the taste and general sensation from the posterior third that is the glossopharyngeal now we come to the vagus nerve the vagus nerve have the same functions with uh, uh, i mean the deep origin the functions of the glossopharyngeal the five generous afferent 
and general visceral afferent, special visceral afferent, and general visceral afferent, special visceral afferent fibers. The deep origin from the same nuclei in the medulla oblongata, except one, from the or to the spinal nucleus of the regiminal nucleus of tractus solitarius, both general visceral afferent and special visceral afferent. The dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, that is the parasympathetic one, general visceral afferent, that is the only different nucleus, and the nucleus ambiguous for the special visceral afferent fibers. Superficial origin, as we said, like all of them between the, the uh, olive and the inferior cervical peduncle, the side of the medulla. Foramen, the same also, it is the middle part of the jugular foramen. Now, the course and relation of the vagus nerve. At the base of the skull, the same story between the internal carotid and the internal jugular, deep to the styloid bros and the structures attached to it and the still believe the gastric. Descend vertically in the carotid sheath between the common carotid and the internal jugular vein, reaching the root of the neck on the right side, it cross the first part of the subclavian artery. That is the subclavian artery here, and that's where the uh, vagus nerve is crossing in front of this part, giving the right recurrent laryngeal nerve. The ganglia again has superior ganglia, which is a, give a branch, which is the auricular branch, to the uh, external ear, xenocosmates, and the tympanic membrane. Inferior ganglia of that nerve. Branches carries general station from the larynx, the trachea, the bronchial tree, the lungs, the alimentary tract down to the junction between the right to third and left to one third of the transverse colon. It also carries stress fibers from the root of the tongue and the biglots. The branches of the vagus in the jugular foramen, it will give the meningeal branch which goes up to supply the dura mater, the posterior cranial fossa. Auricular branch, which uh, bath through the mastoid canaliculus to supply the floor of the posterior wall of the external trameators and the outer surface of the drum, as we have said. The branches again in the neck, the pharyngeal branch or pharyngeal branches, which consist principally or mainly from the cranial part of the accessory, as we have said, or the, or the pharyngeal and laryngeal branches of the vagus are coming from the cranial part of the accessory. It is motor to the pharyngeal plexus through which supply all the muscles of the pharynx, except the velat pharyngeus, which is supplied by the accessory, and the muscles of the palat, except the tensor palati by the mandibular nerve. The branch, a branch to the carotid, a carotid body, superior laryngeal nerve, which passes deep to the intercarotid artery on the lateral wall of the pharynx, and then divides into internal laryngeal, which is sensory for the larynx above the uh, vocal cords. It joins the uh, superior laryngeal vessels to pierce the thyroid membrane to reach the interior of the larynx. And the external laryngeal nerve will supply only one muscle, the cricothyroid muscle. The other branches in the neck is the cardiac branches, which go to the cardiac plexuses, superior inferior branches. Right recurrent laryngeal, which curve around the first part of the subclavian to supply the larynx. As we said, it ascends upwards in a group between the trachea and the esophagus close to the medial surface of the thyroid gland. Supply all intrinsic muscles of the larynx except the cricothyroid, which is supplied by the external laryngeal, and sensations from the larynx below the vocal cords. It gives branches in the thorax, which are cardiac, left recurrent laryngeal, pulmonary, esophageal, in the abdomen, the gastric, the celiac, the hepatic plexus, this is all the branches of the vagus. Again, a summary for these branches, that is the meningeal branch, 
that the cranial part which joined the uh, cranial part actually which will join the vagus that the auricular branch going to the xeroxpiatus that the branch to the carotid body that the pharyngeal branch to the pharyngeal plexus that the superior laryngeal nerve dividing into external and internal that the cardiac branches they are two superior and inferior and that is the right recurrent laryngeal nerve that is summary of the branch of the vagus that is another uh, diagram showing the relation of the nerves of the vagus to the great vessels you can see the pharyngeal branch here passing between the internal carotid and the external carotid while the superior laryngeal passing deep to both of them and the recurrent laryngeal curving around the first part of subclavian that is the main large branches in relation to the large arteries now the accessory nerve the 11th nerve its function is only one the nucleus ambiguous um, uh, that is the cranial part from the nucleus ambiguous and the spinal part from the upper five cervical segments so it has two functions the special visceral efferent fibers and the general uh, somatic uh, efferent fibers the cranial part and the spinal part they are two parts unite within the foramen and then as it come out from the foramen it joins the vagus and this one spinal part will go separately the vagus that is when the cranial part joins the vagus that's how it looks like the foramen magnum is here that is the uh, jugular foramen middle part that is the vagus nerve coming out that is the cranial part of the accessory and that is the spinal part of the accessory here and it's coming from the five cervical about five cervical segments here that is the trapezius muscle and the sternomastoid muscle which are supplied by the spinal part the functions as we said a general somatic efferent for the spinal root a special visceral efferent for the cranial part the deep origin from the nucleus ambiguous and the upper five cervical segments the superficial origin like the others the cranial part from the side between the uh, olive and the inferior cerebellar peduncle the spinal part from the side of the spinal cord the internal course the spinal part as you have seen in the previous slide it ascends in the vertebral canal then through the foramen magnum join the cranial part both leave the cranial cavity through the middle part of the jugular foramen and then divide into the two parts. The course and relation just below the base of the skull, the cranial part separate to join the vagus. The spinal part will lie between the internal jugular and internal carotid, the same story, deep distal abratus, and structures attached to it, and the posterior of the gastric. Then it curves laterally and backwards posterior or sometimes anterior to the internal jugular it will pass through the upper part of the sternomastoid to the posterior triangle in the junction between the upper third and lower two thirds of that muscle it will pierce the muscle at that side and lie along the levator scapulae according to the direction of its fibers to end into the trapezius muscle the branches the cranial part distributed as pharyngeal branches of the vagus. The spinal part supply these two muscles, the trapezius and stigmastoid. The last one is the hypoglossal nerve, the 12th. Its deep origin it has only one function, general somatic efferent to the muscles of the tongue. That is the hypoglossal nucleus here in the floor of the fourth ventricle. That is the dorsal view showing that nucleus in the Hypoglossal, hypoglossal triangle if you remember now this is the function of the uh, 12th cranial nerve the hypoglossal the general somatic efferent the deep origin from the motor nucleus of the hypoglossal in the medulla oblongata the superficial origin from the medulla by more than one around 10 rootlets which come from the side of the medulla between the pyramid and the olive 
and the foramen is from the hypoglossal canal. That is the nerve here. The course and relations leave the skull through the hypoglossal canal, as we said, which lies deep to the internal jugular or medial to it. Then join the three other nerves between the internal jugular and the internal carotid. It has the same story here between the internal jugular and the internal carotid, deep to the cerebellum, the cerebral apparatus, cerebral of the gastric. And then to continue the course in the carotid angle, it curves medially crossing the internal carotid, the external carotid, and the loop uh, formed by the lingual artery. There's a landmark for the hypoglossal, that loop of lingual artery, which is curved upwards and the nerve curved downwards. And then it ascends upwards behind the common tendon of the main gastric, that is the nerve here. Then in the submandibular region, it will pass on the lateral surface of the hyoglossus, this muscle here, that is the hyoglossus, deep to the mylohyoid. As you can see, it is going between these two muscles, the hyoglossus and the uh, mylohyoid, to end by supplying the, uh, uh, the, the, the muscles of the tongue. As, as it goes uh, between these two muscles deep to the mylohyoid, that is the position of the nerve here. Deep to the, that is the mylohyoid, the cut edge, and that is the hyoglossus here. That is the nerve, that is the duct of the uh, submandibular gland, and that is the lingual nerve. It, it lies below of them. So, in terms of between the hyoglossus and the mylohyoid, that is the nerve here. It lies below the deep part of submandibular, which is, has been removed here. The submandibular duct, this one here, and the lingual nerve. Next, it will pass lateral on the left aspect of the genioglossus, which is not shown in this uh, uh, specimen here, and continue in the substance where it breaks into its terminal branches. The branches of this nerve to all intrinsic and external muscles of the tongue, except the palatoglossus, which is supplied by the cranial part of accessory through the pharyngeal branch to the pharyngeal plexus. That is a diagram showing a summary of this uh, hypoglossal nerve. The hypoglossal canal is here. That is the descending hypoglossi, which comes from the first cervical, so does not relate to the nerve. This is a wrong say or wrong name. It is better to, to be named superior limb, and that is the inferior limb or descending cervicalis, united together to form the anza cervicalis. The muscles, that is the hyoglossus muscle, which the nerve is lying on its surface. That is the genioglossus, where the, the nerve will pierce that muscle to reach the tongue. That is the geniohyoid, which is supplied by the first cervical. That is the thyrohyoid, also by the first cervical. Sternohyoid, sternothyroid. Omohyoid, superior inferior billy and superior billy, supplied by the anza cervicals. That's all about the hypoglossal nerve.